Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. Happy Thursday, and it is a thankful Thursday. And we're super excited to be here again to bring you another episode of Transplant Talk with Nashonda. I am your hostess with the mostest, and we are here today to educate you about organ donation. Um, but there are also a few little housekeeping rules we also need to know is that Transplant Talk with Nashonda and Save 1000 Lives is in the business of still registering people to become organ donors. So if you would like to become an organ donor, um, if you would go to donatelifeflorida.org, put this information in and register, or you can go to donatelifeflorida.org or registerme.org. And so as you all are coming in, you know, one day I would like the opportunity to get a hello from everyone in all 50 states. So that is a goal that I would like to uh, hopefully achieve one day, hopefully achieve one day. So again, thank you all for watching. I see people are already starting to log on. So come on in and say hello. And if you have any questions, please make sure that you um, ask the questions and hopefully our host for today, um, that's me, I'm sorry, hopefully our uh, guest for today, who coincidentally is also a host, uh, could perhaps answer your questions as well. And so this month, we know, is February and there are several, several um, events or holidays, we should say, that happens in this month. And so our first holiday is the American um, Heart Health. This is, you know, the Heart Foundation is very active in the community and want you to know that this is absolutely a very special month. And so if you will look here, um, February is Heart Health Month. And it gives you the statistics of how many uh, people actually pass away. I did a little research on for it myself, and it says 30 every 39 seconds. And if you're looking right here, it tells you how many women and men um, are just kind of affected. But every 39 seconds, someone dies from heart disease and stroke. And um, if you read read the information here, about 600,000 people uh, will have a heart attack. That's one in every four. So I wanted you all to kind of see this information or about 600,000 people die of heart disease in the U.S. every year. That's one out of every four. And the majority of heart attacks happen between the hours of eight and nine in the morning. So these are some statistics that I feel that everyone should know. And, you know, make sure that you take good care of yourself because we know Unfortunately, some people just um, some people will pass away from a heart attack. So this month we are definitely going to have some more information and hear from more about heart uh, transplant recipients. And let's not forget on this day, happy donor day on Valentine's Day. So Valentine's Day is National uh, Happy Donor Day. And we are looking for people to actually register to become organ donors on that day so of course we'll be talking more about it um as well and as always my father and my mother is watching and uh thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you they are in mary island and my guest for today also says thank you everyone for watching and joining us so speaking of our guest for today he is again another host and y'all we went all the way back to California. Yay. So we know we have a bit of a time difference, but my, I'm going to call him my co-host for the day, right? I'm going to call him my co-host for the day. And this is Mr. Philip Harris Jones. Um, and he's also an advocate. He is a host um, and he co-hosted with a, with his partner as well. Hello, everybody. Hello, Jonathan. Hello. Uh, hey, Miss Bella. How are you? Beautiful. So we are, again, talking about heart uh, disease this month and National Donor Day. But I guess for today is a kidney. He was a kidney recipient. So he's going to tell us more um, about his story. But before I begin, I've got to say a very, very happy special birthday to my partner in crime. He turned 50 years old today. 
I almost cried because I've had other people in my life to pass away before they turn 50. And just to know that my friend, Derek Bryant, is alive, who is also, um, he's, he's dealt with many, many different things in his life. And God saw fit for him to continue to live. I'm so eternally grateful and, and blessed for him because he's, he really does help me in a mighty, mighty way. So Derek Bryant, if you're listening, you know, I love you to the moon and back. And you are truly my brother and my friend. I'm going to stop talking about you before I cry because, you know, I get sensitive about you. So, again, thank you all for watching. And y'all, thank y'all for giving Derek um, a shout out, um, you know, as well. Yep, that's him, Bella. That is him. So let me bring this guest, my my co-host on today. I'm not even going to call him a guest. I'm going to just call him my co-host so that we can... Um, just have this conversation, y'all, and let me bring him to the stage. But you know, I gotta get bring out the red carpet for my guest for today. I hope he didn't think I will forget about it. So let's welcome him to the show. All right, Mr. Philip Harry Jones Jr., how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. How are you? I am great. I am absolutely great. I know I have been uh, chatting with you for a while. I got to get you on my show. I got to get you on my show. And look, in 2022, I was able to get him. You know, this is a very, very busy man. He is a very busy man. And he does a lot in the community. And he does a lot of shows. I just found out he does a show almost every day. So um, we definitely are excited about um, having you here on the show. Why don't you introduce yourself? I know I did a little bit, but let's introduce yourself to the. I'm on the. I'm on the East Coast, so introduce yourself to the East Coast people all the way from the West Coast. Oh uh, well, before I get started, uh, you know I, I can tell that there's a little uh, lag. So if I'm behind you a little bit, excuse me. Um, but my name is Philip Jones. I do live in Los Angeles, California. Um, I am a kidney transplant recipient that is also um, looking for a living kidney donor um, as well in the process of getting put on uh, the transplant list. I've uh, been fighting chronic kidney disease since the age of four years old, so 28 years. Um, and, you know, this has been, uh, kidney failure pretty much has been my life uh, for the most part, uh, day one. So, um, but in the past uh, few years, I've been able to connect with some wonderful people and be able to uh, advocate for some people as well as work with some wonderful people also. Uh, so, but uh, we all, we'll get into all that stuff throughout the show mm -hmm. uh, and I'll let you get to your questions. All right. Well, you know, we just gonna have a conversation. You're not a guest, honey. You a co-host with me today. So we just go to we just gonna have a conversation about what what you've been through and um what what you expect the year 2020 to bring to your life. So we are again hoping and praying that someone will come and get you that. Absolutely, Bella. God is gonna provide you that kidney soon. So we are definitely hoping and, and praying um for um with that and all of my transplant talk group people y'all thank y'all for coming on make sure that we please share 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 um make sure that you text tag tell somebody about this show and if you can please make sure that you go over to our youtube channel i also have philip's youtube channel that we'll be promoting throughout the show as well so and the more educated you are and i believe that's what we do as hosts and of these podcasts, we want to make sure that people are well educated. Let's kill the myths about what we go through as a as a group, as a multicultural group. And um, this is what we're going to talk about today. And let's not forget that this is also Black History Month. So I'm also excited. And as an educator, I've been it's day three, and I've been killing them with facts about Black history. And so I'm I'm super excited. Um, that uh, Black History Month is now. And I'm also, y'all could call me a little geeky, but you've also had your own little special hand at this Olympics start tomorrow. 
the Olympics start tomorrow. And real quick, y'all, y'all don't know, but I have an Olympian on my show right now, too. My co-host is actually an Olympian. Please share what um what medals you won or your experience in the um in the transplant game. Uh okay, no problem. Uh before I get in, I do want to say uh thank you everybody that's watching. Uh yeah. people I do don't know Audrey, uh Bella, uh Jonathan Trailer, yeah. Trish Phillips. Um yeah. anybody I can't see in the comments, I appreciate <laughs> you uh tuning in uh and watching and support not only myself but Nishanda as well. Um, so the transplant games in America, I was introduced to that in 2008. Once I had my, uh, my kidney transplant at UCLA medical center, um, I was fortunate enough to, to have this wonderful experience, uh, and going out there to Pittsburgh. And so, um, that was, you know, my first, uh, my first experience there, which was overwhelming, uh, a lot of emotions going around because there's a lot of, uh, if you've never been to the transplant games. It's a week event uh, that is surrounded around the transplant community. So transplant recipients, living donors, donor families, supporters, it's thousands of us uh, in one place at one time. Uh, so it's a lot of stories, a lot of emotions going on, uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. So if you get that chance, if it's close enough to you to where it's not too, uh, you know, it's not breaking your pockets too much, definitely try to take that chance to go. Um, that first year, I won three medals. I won one in double bowling uh, with Mark Graves, good friend of mine on Team SoCal. Uh, won one in uh, long jump, and then the four by one for track and field. Uh, oh and, my God. So it was a uh, you know again, take that opportunity if you can. is is definitely worth it. Absolutely. Well. Thank you for sharing uh, that information. And uh, Philip and I was talking and I said, I, I need to do a show with all of the people that have been part of the transplant games. I think that'd be real nice, especially because it's the Olympics. Um, but to have, you know, Shantae and, and Tay and yourself and um, there's some other people. So if you all have been in it as well, you all drop it in the line or send me a message because I really would love to do a show on that especially with the Olympics being this month. So I would like just to put our put a spotlight and a shine on you all as well, because after all that you all have been through, it is more, more than necessary to recognize you, especially because you are a fighter and you are overcomer. So what we know about Olympians is they don't quit. And what we know about transplant recipients, they don't quit so i would love to just make sure that um that i want that i honor you all so bella if you all know anybody else that's been a part of it if your uh if your donor uh was also a part of it whoever it is let's just get a group of people and let's talk about it i think that would be uh super awesome so back to you uh co-host jones um we want to talk about your your beginning of your journey, the beginning of your journey. And you already mentioned it for um, when you were four years old. And I know I was shocked when I heard, you know, before being told that you went that you were going into kidney failure. It was something else that led to that. So give the audience a little a little peek of what happened at four. Uh, so for me, my journey begins at the age of four years old. Um, I got strep throat, which caused it to be a uh, streptococcus. And it was a, it, it made everything kind of go upside down for me. Um, you know, I went through all these symptoms that you hear uh, a lot of people may deal with individually. So swelling, uh, you know, loss of appetite, you know, things of that nature. Uh, I won't get too, too in-depth into it, but um, you know, a number of these things are happening to me at the age of four years old. Um, and so when you're four, you don't, nine times out of 10, you don't notice things like that. You don't notice that your face just swole up. You don't know that, you know, you're bigger than what you normally are. Uh, that's something that we could notice as adults now, you know, and getting older. But at that time, I didn't know. So, um, so, you know, went through that, you know, in school and, uh, I remember I had a kind of really where it starts for me is 
uh, I had a seizure, major seizure uh, in my grandparents' house in their arms uh, for about a good 30 minutes. Uh, I remember I was going kind of back and forth. They were trying to get in touch with my dad uh, to come get me, to take me to the hospital and things of that nature. And uh, so once he got to the house, he got me uh, in the truck and, and drove me to Children's uh, Hospital of Los Angeles. And so when I when I got there, by the time I got there, I stopped. Uh, so when I, I remember, you know, my dad always make mention, he's like, when you got the car, as soon as you got out of the truck, you went straight into another seizure. And I'm like, I have to remember that. Don't remember the, the whole thing exactly, but I, I do partially remember that. Um, but then I do remember uh, the seizure that I had in the hospital. They called... Uh, Call my, uh, you know, the nephrologist, the physician down when I got there and he met us there at the front desk. I had a seizure sitting there and then uh, the doctor was able, you know, that, that actually is what saved me because if you've ever dealt with seizures, you know that sometimes uh, physicians can't tell off blood work. They have to see what's going on during these seizures. Wow. Uh, wow. And so my, my doctor was able to to notice, notice what was going on during my seizures. And so he was able to, excuse me, take the uh, course of uh, action from that point on to make the right uh, choice for me medically. So, um, you know, uh, from that point, you know, kidney function plummeted from there pretty much 30%. I was on dialysis for a small amount of time. I was in a hospital. Um, and then from that point on, four years old, until the age of 16, I was on 30% kidney function. Um, still 30%. went to my appointments. Go ahead. 30%. Yeah. 30% 30, 30 kidney function. Uh, was not uh, uh, ready for dialysis yet, um, full time or anything like that. So, um, but once I got to uh, 16 years old, um, I remember I came in for an appointment, you know, doing blood work every month, appointments every month. Uh, and so I remember when I came in and, you know, my doctor was like, hey, your blood work came back, but your numbers are starting to plummet and, it, and they're going down fast. So it's time for you to make that transition onto dialysis, onto the list, get ready for this transplant. And, you know, I, I say this a, a number of times to people is that, before, I used to wonder why my doctor used to always say every month, every appointment, he used to always say, you know, you're going to need a transplant. You know, you're going to need a transplant. You got to go on dialysis. And as a kid, when when parents and, and adult figures are repeating things like this to you, you get irritated because you're like, I'm tired of hearing you tell me this. But then I, it took me until I was an adult to understand that had he not done it, I probably wouldn't have been as ready as I was for when it came. Uh, okay. Because for me, it was just it was just transition time for me, right? It was right. just go from you know this to dialysis. That's, that's pretty much all it was for me. So, um, made that transition into a uh, into dialysis, uh, peritoneal dialysis, um, at 16 years old, um, which was uh, August of 2006, uh, February 2007. Uh, 17 years old and. I got a call from UCLA Medical Center uh, saying that they had a kidney for me. So I was only on dialysis uh, for six months. In between that six months, and this is the one thing that a lot of people like, it, I, they're mad and then happy at the same time. But even when I was on dialysis, I was still able to play football. And so, you know, that was something that also kind of kept me sane here because a lot well, one thing that I do know, a lot of people uh, – mentioned when they when they talk about that transition of going into dialysis and things like that is having to stop doing what they love to do and right. so uh i was able to continue doing that right football i've been around football all my life my dad coached college football i've been around the game you know years so that's what i love to do uh so i was still able to play the game had my uh my transplant um I was a year younger than everybody else, so I still had that gap in time to be able to go back and mm -hmm. finish uh, finish school. So um, after my transplant and recovery process today, 
recovery went great. Um, I went to uh, went back to school, finished, got my diploma, um, graduated. Uh, that same year, 2008, was uh, the attachment to what we talked about earlier, the transplant games. Mm -hmm. uh, which was in Pittsburgh uh, at that time. Um, to right. Kind of get to that story. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Right. I, I've I've definitely wanted to just kind of ease in there just a little bit because I remember how you told me about this story. But um, I, I wanted to know about your your family. How were how instrumental were your parents with um, your transition, and how did your friends handle? you being on dialysis did you have to teach them did um did they know how how did that go with your interactions with with your classmates and your friends those are two different sides of my story <laughs> um okay. with my family they are the reason why i'm still here um mm -hmm. their support their love their care is the number one reason outside of god's grace is why i am still here um, you know, they never you know, looked at me differently. They were always there for me, no matter what the situation uh, was that I was dealing with at the time. Uh, they've been there 100 percent. And, you know, like I mentioned to you before, my parents were divorced, but they were still able to uh, share the love and still be able to take care of me, even in two different households with two different families and still be able to raise me to be who I am today. So very grateful to have uh, the people that God blessed me with as my family, as my parents, as my you know cousins, uh, you know my brother, my sisters, my you know aunts, uncles, uh, gone or still here, you know. And so, um, but when it comes to friends, that part of my life is a lot different. And okay. anybody that, that I've had this conversation with knows is I, I didn't tell the people that I grew up with my issues. Um, and that was because at an early age, I realized that kids are cruel. <laughs> I mean, you're a teacher, and you know, kids can be mean sometimes, right? They are. And they are. Especially when they don't understand. Mm -hmm. When they don't understand, the first thing they go to is a joke, right? And, and so I made sure that I just kind of kept that part of my life separate from school. I wanted to be Philip as opposed to fill up the transplant or or kidney failure kid as walking around school, right? I want to be known for who I am as a person, not right. my illness. Right. So uh, the only people who knew, it was a very, very limited amount of people who knew um, about that. It was probably about, man, probably a talk between when everything started for me and high school, and the end of high school, I think maybe a total of 10 people knew while I was in school okay. um, because I kept it to myself. So, But when you left and didn't come back, they, they wasn't wondering where you were? That was when they found out. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, they didn't find out until after that because what happened was I actually went to graduation, you know, because I still had a lot of friends that, you know, in that class that graduated and stuff like that. And again, like I said, my recovery process went great. So I wanted to, you know, I was the doctor had pretty much, uh, you know, you know, you know how to transplant thing. I mean, you know, but um, after a certain amount of time, then that's when they say, all right, you're good to go. You know, you can start going back out again and doing things and stuff like that. So um, I got to the point early, early in time, maybe about a good, uh, what was that, February? So end of February, so around March or May was when my doctor said, you're free, pretty much. Uh, uh, so um, I went to uh, um, went to graduation and, and you know, of course that was the you know, first thing people were asking was, you know, what happened? You just up and left and this and that. And I'm like, I didn't yeah. want to tell y'all what was going on. So, you know, but I, you know, I told them then and uh you know some understood some were still lacking the understanding of everything right um, so that, and, but i think that's where um when it's a teachable moment uh we should take those opportunities especially because although they can be cruel they still you know would just kind of be receptive and and kind of have sympathy or you know something but 
the more, and, and you're not the first guest to say that because I have other guests that, you know, my husband didn't want anybody to know. And then that is a missed opportunity to be able to educate people on, you know, how you're taking care of yourself and how you're managing yourself and how you keep going. You know, I think those opportunities are missed opportunities, but I'm glad you took the opportunity afterwards just to kind of explain to them and good Lord, look at all the things that you're doing now. So if you were quiet before, you shine in front of rooftops now for everybody to know and um, about, you know, kidney uh, kidney disease and, and why it's important to just take care of your house. So, you know, kudos to you for, for what you're doing now. Yeah. It, excuse me. <coughs> you can use it as a teaching moment. Um, but at the same time, the person that you're teaching has to be receptive to the information right. that you're giving them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not always the case. So, uh, for me, I just I kind of got to the point where I can start. I started to see people wondering. When I see you wondering, that means you want to know. You're you're intrigued mm -hmm. about, you know, what it is that's going on. Now mm -hmm. I know that you'll sit and you'll listen and take in what I'm giving you. You know what information I'm telling you, um, as opposed to somebody who's just like, you know, they just there just to listen to what you're saying and not really taking in. Uh, what you're telling them so you know it just it just depends on the moment no right I, I get it but now you you were mentioning you were going into the story about the Olympics so go ahead and continue that part um because we know that this is where where some things happen so please share okay. <coughs> Y'all, please excuse him. He has this, this little cough. And I have to tell my students all the time that they don't know. I know COVID is still around and they don't want to wear their masks. But I tell them, please be considerate of other people that, you know, might have a compromised immune system where it would take, you know, us that don't have a compromised immune system, maybe two or three days to kind of get over, you know, get over a cold or, or a flu or something. It will take them, you know, a lot longer. So please keep that in mind. And to all the viewers that are watching, you know, as well, we have to protect this. We have to protect this community. We have to protect each other. So if you would, please, you know, just wear the mask because, as you can see, it, it does affect more than you. You know, there are other people around that we, we should be conscientious of and we should protect them from our germs, you know. And, and and be considerate of it and, and wear your mask. So are you all right now, Philip? I, I'm I'm hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to keep it together, you know. Well, let me um, say some hellos while you still coughing. Yeah, um, please. That that would be wonderful. <laughs> hey Tanya, how you doing, Miss Brown? And hello, Steve and Derek. I saw you coming on. We want we want to make sure my co-host is all right. Um for the day and yeah dad we we appreciate his family uh for you know and the friends for even listening and hey miss verna you know i love me some of you and y'all i don't know if you all seen this but this is mr um johnny and i would love to have you share your experience johnny he's a team manager of team manager okay team manager of team manager from well he he would love to share the transplant game the experience and i would love to have you and thank you mr edward why not drake um sir I, I hear i need to speak to you as well i have you on my show i hear you're doing great things so i would absolutely love to have you so um edward we we need to connect all right we need to connect mr why not all right so let me see oh Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edward. And again, we need to connect, sir. So let's do that. All right. Are, are we better now, Philip? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I went on ahead and just put one of these calls in my mouth. So I'm going to try to keep it to where it's not, uh, you know, irritating okay. either. So okay. but, well, I won't hold you too much longer because I don't want no, to. No, be no, we're good. We're good. You know, All I'm right. Gonna, gonna be on. <laughs> um, but no, I, I do want to touch on, on a couple. You know, Johnny is a. A great, great person. Mm -hmm. Outside of the uh, the transplant uh, games, uh, being our, mm -hmm. our manager of Team SoCal, Johnny is also a heart transplant recipient. 
Um, also, oh, um, great, great guy. Great guy. Met Johnny at the uh, Ambassadors training a couple years ago, right before the uh, the transplant games, and then we went to the games. And great dude, great dude. Like you said, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Why Not, Edward Drake. You know, that's my brother right there. He brought me oh, in the Why Not problem. Foundation, and you know, trying trying to make some things happen uh, around the country. So, um, but to get back into into my my story. Um, the, the transplant games uh that year 2008 mm -hmm. i ended up tearing my meniscus in my right knee um of course at the time i didn't know that's what the issue was until you know further medical evaluation and things of that nature but um on the way home um i had a four-hour flight from pittsburgh and so all i knew was as i'm walking around the airport my knee is on fire. I knew I was going to need something. I was going to be able to sit on this cramped Southwest flight from Pittsburgh to LA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm like, I need something. And again, like I, like I mentioned you before, this is my literally my second time in an airport. So I don't know what happens in an airport, right? I'm like, all mm -hmm. I know is people have missed flights and gotten lost and I'm like, I'm not trying to be that person. Okay. Uh, that's not the story that I need added to my list of stories. So, um, I'll, you know, every all the transplant patients around me all had Motrin. Nobody had Tylenol. There was no Tylenols in the stores that was in the surrounding area where we were. And I'm like, I need something because I'm not going to be able to just sit on this flight for four hours. You know, otherwise I'm in super trouble when I get home. So uh ended up taking a Motrin. For some of you who don't know that um Motrin is what you don't take if you're mm -hmm. a kidney patient. Right? That's the one that you don't take. And at the time, at, the, at that young age, I did not know that. Um mm -hmm. and so it you know it just it just ended up being a bad situation for me. Um and so that one bad situation pretty much turned my life upside down again, uh, which led me to rejection of my kidney, um, which lasted for about a total of three years. Uh, so it rejected uh, 2010. Um, and so that kind of goes into a, a another the, it's like the bridge of the whole story. So if you have questions, you know, or you want to stop here or you want me to continue, just let me know what you want me to do. No, I'm, I'm, again, glad that you took that teachable moment, you know, just to let people know that um, with your kidney, you can only take a certain kind of medicine. And then with your liver, you can only take a certain kind of medicine. So, so can you repeat that again? Um, so liver patients are supposed to take Motrin and not Tylenol. Uh, kidney patients are supposed to take Tylenol and not Motrin. Or well, like Bella said, no incense ever. Uh, so that's why they ask you to take uh, Tylenol instead of like Motrin, Advil, Aleve, you know, those types of uh, medications. Um, and so it's, you know, it's again, it's, it's just, it was something that I was not, uh, the message I was not relayed to myself um, and, you know, I don't blame anybody else. I don't blame the doctors. I don't blame myself. I don't blame, you know, it was just one of those moments, you know, and, and who knows, maybe me going through that led me to where I am now, right? Uh, granted, you know, we're going to get to this long story of, of in-between nonsense that I've had to deal with after that. But, you know, um, who knows what, you know, what, how my path goes if that particular situation, learning experience does not happen. Um, yeah. I don't call it a mistake. I call it a learning experience because mm -hmm. I was able to learn from that situation and also teach others at the same time. So it wasn't one of those situations where like, oh, man, I was stupid. I was, you know, yeah, it was, it was, you know, like, but hey, what can I do, right? You know, I just keep moving, keep fighting and keep striving, so. Yeah, wow. I want to make sure that kidney lasted as long as it was supposed to be moving on to. All right, so the new one. All right, Bella. Y'all see Bella. That's my other co-host. Uh, she was the host of um, 
the women when we talked to them, when we spoke about mental health. So she was the host for my mental health uh, for women only. So Bella, you know, we got to get you back, lady. We got to do some more. We got to do some more talking um, to you. And thank you all for um, just being here. Yep, he is a warrior. And, and happy birthday, man. That's my friend, Derek, y'all. So everybody was saying happy birthday to you, Derek. Already. Oh, happy birthday, Derek. Happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. And so he's waiting for it. Um, he's waiting for a, a transplant as well. So we are um we're we're talking about those those in between. I know you had a lot of other um, you know, incidents that happen, you know, along the way because this incident caused you to no longer well, what caused you not to be on the on the transplant list? You had to work your way back up um to get back on the list again. Can you share that information? Yeah, I'll, I'll get this is one part in front of that uh, that I do want to get to that I, I okay. actually sometimes seem to to miss when I tell my story. But um, well, give it. so after that happened, right, uh, it was mm -hmm. kind of a, a hectic three months for me. Um, August 2010, like I said, I went back on uh, dialysis, made that transition to um, uh, in-center hemodialysis. Um, and then a month later, um, it seemed like four years old happened all over again. Kidney failure led to a seizure um, that landed me in the hospital for about two weeks. Wasn't as bad as the first first one I was in for two and, two and a half months. So um, this, this next one here, um, 2010, I was only in for about two weeks. Um, and then a couple weeks after that, um, uh, my life turned upside down is not even the best way to put this. It just it was a tornado for me. Um, it was, you know, one of those days where you just feel like crap. You mm -hmm. had, can't put your finger on what the issue is. Right. Um, so I went through the whole day, you know, just dealing with this pain. And I remember I said, you know what? I need to just go ahead and go to the emergency room. Went to the emergency room. And I remember the doctor said, uh, you know, we're going to do a, uh, a CAT scan for you, you know, and, and make sure there's nothing going on, you know, in that part of it and everything like that. Because I was dealing with this really, really bad headache. And I mean, I was, it was horrible. It was as bad as the one that I had before the, that last seizure. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I remember, by, I, I remember waking up and my doctor I mean, the nurse comes in and says, or oh, the doctor too, but they walked in and they said, uh, uh, Mr. Jones, uh, you have a uh, subdural hematoma, uh, brain bleed uh, in your brain, and you're going to need emergency brain surgery to repair it. Uh, for me, everything kind of fell apart because a couple years before that, my grandfather had just had... Uh, emergency brain surgery as well. And I remember watching him and everything that he had to go through post-surgery, you know, learning how to walk on his own again, learning how to, you know, eat again, uh, you know, try to bring memories back, you know, remembering who people are and things of that nature. And, I, you know, like I told you before, I man, you know, my family is my everything. And so um, that was really kind of the main thing for me was, you know, if I go through this and I make it and I can't even remember these people, what's the point of me even being here when they're the ones who got me here? Right. Um, so I remember, uh, you know, I went through that. I was in there for about a, for about a month after, uh, after surgery. I think I was out for about a good day or two uh, before I came, before I came to. Uh, after the procedure and uh, you know recovery went well and everything again you know uh, all levels and stuff like that came back you know where they needed to be and uh, so went through went through that whole thing I was you know and, and found out that the reason for my bleed was um, the heparin anybody that's ever done done it or taking care of someone who's gone to in-center hemodialysis uh you know that heparin is used as a beta blocker basically it's used to to stop blockage in your port 
um, and things of that nature. So uh, that medicine was caused for me to have my bleed. Um, and so because of that, um, it was noted as a, uh, a allergy. So they could not give it to me. Um, and so what happened was over time in the past three years, I had a lot of situations where I had to get my port taken out, switch to the other side, a number mm -hmm. of times, about five or six times I had this procedure done in about three years because it kept getting clogged. It kept blocking because they couldn't put that medication in to keep it from doing that. Um, so there's a lot of things in me. I'm not, you know, I, we kind of deep into this. So, um, so in, you know, in that time, I, at that time I was on the list. I was on the list at that time. Uh, you know, things were, you know, dealing with some level issues and, and some blood work, but things were getting taken care of. And, um, I remember I got to the point where, uh, I had two instances at this, uh, at, at my medical facility, and this is what caused me um, to be taken off the list, right? Because if you know, the number one thing that they talk about is compliant mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to a transplant, right? They want to make sure that you're going to take your medications when you need to, make appointments when you need to, pick up the mm -hmm. phone when you need to, call when you need to. You know, all that stuff plays a, a role in compliance. Uh, so for me, um, I, and I'm just going to tell you the scenarios of what happened. The order may be off. I always get them mixed up. But uh, one situation was um, I take e uh, epigen uh, shots. And so that is a big one that they use as compliance because it's medication. Um, <clears throat> so... What happened was I put the order in for this particular medication. And uh, when I went to go pick it up to be able to give myself that shot that day, I got there and they said that there was nothing in the computer for that order, uh, which caused me to go over time because I had to wait for that medication to be to be ready and put another order put back in for it. And then I ended up having to go to the emergency room to get, get that taken care of. That was one strike. The other one was um, for kidney patients uh, on dialysis, you do a test called KT over V. This is where they check your clearance, make sure that the regimen that you're on, whether it's in center hemo or uh, home, uh, home peritoneal dialysis, and they make sure that your you know, the regimen that you're on is adequate enough for you and it's, it's clean your blood out and, and you're you know healthy and able to function and things of that nature. So. Um, uh, you have to do that test on your own. So you go to, you know, you do it with your blood work, um, for in center hemo, I mean, I'm sorry, um, peritoneal dialysis, you, uh, you take a sample of your dialysate after your session, uh, in a, a specimen container, you take it when you go do your blood work, there's a blood work that goes with that as well when they do all your other blood work. Um, and so with that, um, the purse, the lab tech that was in at the time did not secure the way he should have. Um, he just automatically assumed that what I turned in was urine and did whatever the protocol is for urine as opposed to dialysate. So mm -hmm. when I went in did my blood work and everything. I noticed they only did one tube. And, you know, you, you, you notice stuff, but you don't really question it. And I say, you know, maybe they know something I don't know. Maybe there's a reason why it's only one. So I didn't even say anything. So I remember I called back because normally my nurse calls me back like that day. Because I usually go first thing in the morning. And I didn't got a call like two days. So I called her. That's part of your compliance. You got to make sure the stuff is getting done. So, um, I called and, he, and he's like, you know, let me check him and make sure. And when he looked, he said, there's nothing here. And I'm like, what are you talking about? There's nothing there. And I went to go, you know, I went to go do my blood work and everything. And he said, wait a minute. He said, there is one test here, but that's it. I said, yeah, I know, because they only took one vial. And he was like, okay, well, something's wrong. Uh, 
come to find out they had to go do this super duper investigation to figure out what happened. And but by the time all this stuff came out, they had pretty much already written it off as me not being compliant and doing what I needed to do to have these numbers in at the time that it was supposed to be in. Oh, which wow. put me in a position to where they basically were like, all right, you know, we're putting you on hold and taking you off the list. So mm-hmm. had I not had those two instances happen, you know, I probably would, have, you know, hopefully God would, would have had a uh, a transplant by now, you know, but um, th- that is because the reason why um, I'm now in the process of having to get replaced on the list. Yeah. And and you also missed out on the opportunity to receive another kidney because of this in, in honoring someone's uh, relative that they wanted to bless you with uh, that as well. So, well, we, we are definitely praying that um, that what are you back on the list now or you're still waiting? Uh, no, I'm I'm still in the process. I have a. Uh... Uh, one point, one more appointment before the evaluation appointment, uh, which I'll do next week, and then the the last appointment is evaluation at um, Cedar Sinai Medical Center, which is where I've decided uh, to do my transplant. Okay, well, you got it. Um, listen, you you've given so much vital information and, and very informative and everybody is just really commenting of what a great warrior and wanting you to you know stay prayed up and hello miss lisa how are you and everyone else that has um just jumped on on the um on the program i thank you from the bottom of my heart and again this is why both of us are you know podcast podcast hosts and we have these opportunities for people to come and share because he has dropped so many nuggets um, this this evening, um, especially with the Tylenol. And, and uh, Bella, thank you so much for um, chiming in as well about, um, and what did she say again? She said, no inset. And I don't oh, yeah, really. No mm-hmm. What is it called again? Inset. So like Aleve, Motrin, Advil, uh, okay. anything kind of in that in that family. Uh, mm-hmm. Tylenol is a medication, but it's not an NSAID. It's not considered as a as an NSAID, which is why it's uh, uh, you know the on that okay uh, side of everything for kidney patients uh, okay. to be able to to take those medications. Well, well, I'm telling you, this is um, I, I learned a lot, and I being an educator, I know some people might take it for granted. But I love to be in a posture of learning. And so all of this information that that you have shared also helps me and continues um, in continuing my journey of being a host and just finding out how much more information I don't know. Um, So thank you, everyone, uh, for sharing. And I'm not going to hold Mr. Philip um, Jones Jr. too much longer because of his voice um, and his cough. I'm sorry, because of his cough. But I'm here I, for it. I, I told you. You're here for it. I'm here for it. So, yo. Know, okay. But if I, we I gonna just, change lives and teach and do things. Let's get it done. Let's do what we gotta yeah. do. Yeah. And and speaking of teaching, he is like when I said that he is busy, y'all. He is really really busy with school and like he's going to school. He's hosting. I don't know when he finds time to sleep, but um, I don't. Somewhere, you know? <laughs> I don't. I get yelled at about that consistently. Yeah. You know, yeah. we are on, man. You got to get you some sleep, man. You got to get you some sleep. And we're saying the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. All, you know, all of them, they all say the same thing. You got to get you some sleep. I'm like, when? Like, when yeah. is this sleep going to happen for me? Let you know, me tell you. I know people like to say, I sleep when I die. But in your case, I need you to get some sleep, sir. I need you to take take a meditation and and go ahead and go just take a little rest. Just take a little rest. Um, but I do have one last question because I believe we might have to have a part two because there's so much more there that we haven't even touched upon. But for anyone that's on the fence about organ donation, 
and becoming an organ donor, what would you say to them? Take the chance you would want somebody to take on you. Mm -hmm. um, you, you were in that situation of needing an organ. Uh, I'm pretty sure the first thing you said was, don't you want, you know, in your mind, you would say, don't you want to, you know, help me and, and, you know, keep me here on earth and things of that nature. So think about it the reverse way. They pretty much asking you the same question. You know, they, they want the same thing that you would more than likely want if you were in that position. So, you know, that's what I try to tell people all the time is switch reverse roles. Act like you were that person in their position. How would you want this to play out? Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to be on dialysis for 10 to 12 years, you know, going in center or hooking up to a, a peritoneal dialysis machine every night? Or you want to get a call and they say, hey, we got a kidney for, or, well, you know, there's somebody that's a match for you, you yeah. know? Um, and, I, and I know it's easier to, to, to say than do. I, you know, I know it's one of those situations, but um, honestly, all I can do is, is just pray that um, a, lot, a lot more people start to do their research on this thing because the one thing I know that we do deal with a lot is um, these myths that we need to debunk um, that go around that people believe in. Um, yeah. You know, I tell people all the time, don't just believe just because somebody told you something. Do your research. And I don't mean go to WebMD. I'm talking about, you know, contact, you know, if you, if you, it doesn't even have to be your nephrologist or your right. cardiologist, you know, or anything like that. You know, contact your, the close, if you know somebody, you know, that's in your family or whatever, contact them. I talk to a number of different doctors uh, all the time you know, mm -hmm. about uh, specific things, you know, um, and, and I, you know, it's, to me, it's find out what you really need to know to make this decision. Yeah. Uh, the yeah. one thing that, that irritates me is uh, the money thing. And, and that's the thing. Don't do it just because there are those crazy people out there that are willing to, you know, pay you for your mm -hmm. organ or whatever like that, right? That's not the right way to do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, go ahead and just, you know, be giving. I mean, it's, again, We I think we anybody on that's watching or part of this uh, broadcast right now knows that you can go and live a wonderful, wonderful life with one kidney, part of your liver, you know, um, it's, uh, it's you know, of course, uh, you know, heart and, and lungs and stuff like those are things that, you know, have to be given after we leave here. But even in those situations, where are you taking them? Right. Where, where, where are you taking them? You, you gonna put them in, the, in the, uh, you gonna vacuum seal them and, and and take you, you know, wherever you decide to go after after Earth, like you know, it, it, right. When you pass away, where right. are you going? Right. Right. You can't take them with you. So you can't take them with you. They're not giving. <laughs> Thank Might you. Well be given, be given, be loving, save someone's life. You know, uh, and I, I'll mention this real quick. Something that um, was brought to my attention over the past couple of weeks, actually, um, on our show uh, that me and Tafaro did uh, with some uh, some guests from the UK that we had on our show recently. Um, and you may know one of the, one of his, her name is uh, D Moore, who is the host of a uh, Diary of a Kidney Warrior, and she's in uh, in the UK. And then I, I we interviewed a living kidney donor. His name was Ali, and he's in uh, London. And what I found out about that area in transplantation is that when you're born, you're automatically on the list, right? Right. And you have to opt out in order to be taken off the list and mm -hmm. i think that's something that we need to adopt in the united states because it would definitely save a lot more lives and take a lot more people off of uh off of the list you know because one thing that i know and i, and I hate to mention this because kids mean a lot to me excuse me is that 
we deal with infant and pregnancy loss, right? And I mean, a pregnancy part, excuse me, is not something that can really be feasible for this situation, but the infant loss um, where those organs are still able to be given to someone else and save someone's life, mm -hmm. um, you know? And so if, if they're already on the list, when it happens, it's going to be an automatic transition. It's going to be, it's going from point A to point B. There's no mm -hmm. thinking. There's no, hey, have you thought about if you wanted to donate? Or, you know, that conversation doesn't have to happen because it's right. already in effect, right? It's mm -hmm. going to take so many people off the list just, you know, with the addition of that. And again, I hate to even think about it, mention it. I have God kids that I've, I've lost. Uh, cousins that I've lost at, at infant age um, and things of that nature. So to think about it, it hurts me, but those are still ways to be able to save people's lives. Absolutely. Uh, and so we have to learn to position ourselves in a way to be able to save more lives. That's why you got, you know, 3D printable uh, kidneys and, you know, pig and, and uh, pig kidneys are right. coming down the line mm -hmm. and, you got uh, the uh, bioartificial kidney coming down the line and, you know, things of that nature. These are all things that are going to put us in a position to save more lives. But we have Absolutely. to think that way before they even get here. Absolutely. I thank you again. So you kick so much knowledge. You, you share a wealth of knowledge with us, a wealth of information. And I, kept, I was putting you, the name of your show, guys. Again, it's on Facebook, a second a second chance 2021 and so the people were asking what's the name of your show my dad asked what's the name of your show so uh guys if you all would um the <laughs> miss devil said she'll take a pic let me tell y'all something that that is another show we are going to do a show about the the man receiving the pig's heart we got to so all my heart um transplant talk with nashonda warriors we are going to do a special heart show and i would love to hear uh, your opinion about that, but we are over time, but I can't be mad at you um, with this because it was such uh, very informative and great information. So thank you all uh, for watching uh, Transplant Talk uh, with Nashonda, with my special co-host for the day, because this man, did, he wasn't just no guest. He brought it and he gave us a lot of information. So I'm greatly appreciative. Thank you for even coming early and he, because he's on the West Coast with my friend Emmett over there. Um, so please, everyone, consider becoming an organ donor. Thank you all for watching. We definitely going to have to have a, a part two. Yes, Miss Lisa, good night. And um, I definitely uh, appreciate him. So until next time, remember that organ donation does not only save lives, but organ donation changes lives. So until next week. God bless you all. Good night. And I'm going to contact the, the what's his name again? John, what's his name? With the um, transplant games, we're going to connect. Oh, Johnny, gonna... Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, message, uh, I'll do like an introductory uh, message uh, for both yeah. of uh, and other people as well. So, yeah, Mr. Uh, Why Not. <laughs> thank you. Uh, also, I'm, Thelma, uh, good, great seeing you. Hope uh, everything is well and everybody I watch. Uh, we greatly yeah. appreciate uh, your love and your support. Uh, Absolutely. Not only myself, but Nishanda as well. So yeah. hope you guys have a great night. All right, guys. So until next time, again, I'm not going to talk anymore. God bless you all. <laughs> and good night.